Chapter Seven. Yet the next moment there seemed to be some evidence that ghosts had a more condescending disposition than Mr. Macy attributed to them, for the pale, thin figure of Silas Marner was suddenly seen standing in the warm light, uttering no word, but looking round at the company with his strange, unearthly eyes. The long pipes gave a simultaneous movement, like the antennae of startled insects, and every man present, not excepting even the sceptical farrier, had an impression that he saw not Silas Marner in the flesh, but an apparition. For the door by which Silas had entered was hidden by the high screen seats, and no one had noticed his approach. Mr. Macy, sitting a long way off the ghost, might be supposed to have felt an argumentative triumph which would tend to neutralize his share of the general alarm. Had he not always said that when Silas Marner was in that strange trance of his, his soul went loose from his body? Here was the demonstration. Nevertheless, on the whole, he would have been as well contented without it. For a few moments there was a dead silence, Marner's want of breath and agitation not allowing him to speak. The landlord, under the habitual sense that he was bound to keep his house open to all company, and confident in the protection of his unbroken neutrality, at last took on himself the task of adjuring the ghost. "'Master Marner,' he said in a conciliatory tone, "'what's lacking to you? What's your business here?' "'Robbed!' said Silas, gaspingly. "'I've been robbed. I want the constable and the justice and Squire Cass and Mr. Crackenthorpe.' "'Lay hold on him, Jem Rodney,' said the landlord, the idea of a ghost subsiding. He's off his head, I doubt. He's wet through." Jem Rodney was the outermost man, and sat conveniently near Marner's standing-place, but he declined to give his services. "'Come and lay hold on him yourself, Mr. Snell, if you've got a mind,' said Jem rather sullenly. "'He's been robbed and murdered too, for what I know,' he added in a muttering tone. "'Jem Rodney!' said Silas, turning and fixing his strange eyes on the suspected man. "'My master Marner, what do you want with me?' said Jem, trembling a little, and seizing his drinking-can as a defensive weapon. "'If it was you stole my money,' said Silas, clasping his hands entreatingly, and raising his voice to a cry, "'give it me back, and I won't meddle with you. I won't set the constable on you. Give it me back, and I'll let you—I'll I let you have a guinea.' "'Me stole your money?' said Jem angrily. I'll pitch this can at your eye if you talk of my stealing your money. Come, come, Master Marner, said the landlord, now rising resolutely and seizing Marner by the shoulder. If you've got any information to lay, speak out sensible, and show as you're in your right mind, if you expect anybody to listen to you. You're as wet as a drowned rat. Sit down and dry yourself, and speak straight forward. Ah, to be sure, man, said the farrier who began to feel that he had not been quite on a par with himself and the occasion. "'Let's have no more staring and screaming, else we'll have you strapped for a madman. That's why I didn't speak at the first. Thinks I, the man's run mad.' "'Aye, aye, make him sit down,' said several voices at once, well pleased that the reality of ghosts remained still an open question. The landlord forced Marner to take off his coat, and then to sit down on a chair aloof from everyone else in the centre of the circle and in the direct rays of the fire. The weaver, too feeble to have any distinct purpose beyond that of getting help to recover his money, submitted unresistingly. The transient fears of the company were now forgotten in their strong curiosity, and all faces were turned towards Silas, when the landlord, having seated himself again, said, "'Now then, Master Marner, what's this you've got to say, as you've been robbed? Speak out!' "'He'd better not say again as it was me who robbed him,' cried Jem Rodney hastily. "'What could I have done with his money? I could as easily steal the parson's surplus and wear it.' "'Hold your tongue, Jem, and let's hear what he's got to say,' said the landlord. "'Now then, Master Marner.' Silas now told his story under frequent questioning as the mysterious character of the robbery became evident. This strangely novel situation of opening his trouble to his Ravelow neighbours of sitting in the warmth of a hearth not his own, and feeling the presence of faces and voices which were his nearest promise of help, had doubtless its influence on Marner, in spite of his passionate preoccupation with his loss. Our consciousness rarely registers the beginning of a growth within us any more than without us. There have been many circulations of the sap before we detect the smallest sign of the bud. 
The slight suspicion with which his hearers at first listened to him gradually melted away before the convincing simplicity of his distress. It was impossible for the neighbours to doubt that Marner was telling the truth, not because they were capable of arguing at once from the nature of his statements to the absence of any motive for making them falsely, but because, as Mr. Macy observed, folks as had the devil to back him were not likely to be so mushed as poor Silas was. Rather, from the strange fact that the robber had left no traces, and had happened to know the nick of time, utterly incalculable by mortal agents, when Silas would go away from home without locking his door, the more probable conclusion seemed to be that his disreputable intimacy in that quarter, if it ever existed, had been broken up, and that, in consequence, this ill turn had been done to Marner by somebody it was quite in vain to set the constable after. Why this preternatural felon should be obliged to wait till the door was left unlocked was a question which did not present itself. "'It isn't Jem Rodney has done this work, Master Marner,' said the landlord. "'You mustn't be a cast in your eye at poor Jem. There may be a bit of a reckoning against Jem for the matter of a hair or so, if anybody was bound to keep their eyes staring open and never to wink, but Jem's been a-sitting here drinking his can like the decentest man in the parish.' since before you left your house, Master Marner, by your own account. Aye, aye, said Mr. Macy, let's have no accusing of the innocent. That isn't the law. There must be folks to swear again a man before he can be taken up. Let's have no accusing of the innocent, Master Marner. Memory was not so utterly torpid in Silas that it could not be awakened by these words. With a movement of compunction as new and strange to him as everything else within the last hour, he started from his chair and went close up to Jem, looking at him as if he wanted to assure himself of the expression in his face. "'I was wrong,' he said. "'Yes, yes, I ought to have thought. There's nothing to witness against you, Jem. Only you'd been into my house oftener than anybody else, and so you came into my head. I don't accuse you. I won't accuse anybody. Only—' he added, lifting up his hands to his head, and turning away with bewildered misery. "'I try—' I try to think where my guineas can be. Aye, aye, they're gone where it's hot enough to melt them, I doubt, said Mr. Macy. Tchew, said the farrier, and then he asked with a cross-examining air, How much might there be in the bags, Master Marner? Two hundred and seventy-two pounds, twelve and sixpence, last night when I counted it, said Silas, seating himself again with a groan. Pooh, why, they'd be none so heavy to carry. Some tramp's been in, that's all. And as for the no footmarks and the bricks and the sand being all right, why, your eyes are pretty much like an insect's, Master Marner. They're obliged to look so close you can't see much at a time. It's my opinion as if I'd been you, or you'd been me, for it comes to the same thing, you wouldn't have thought you'd found everything as you left it. But what I vote is that two of the sensiblest of the company should go with you to Master Kench, the constable's. He's ill abed, I know that much, and get him to appoint one of us his deputy. For that's the law, and I don't think anybody'll take upon him to contradict me there. It isn't much of a walk to Kench's, and then, if it's me as his deputy, I'll go back with you, Master Marner, and examine your premises. And if anybody's got any fault to find with that, I'll thank him to stand up and say it out like a man. By this pregnant speech the farrier had re-established his self-complacency and waited with confidence to hear himself named as one of the superlatively sensible men. "'Let's see how the night is, though,' said the landlord, who also considered himself personally concerned in this proposition. "'Why, it rains heavy still,' he said, returning from the door. "'Well, I'm not the man to be afraid of the rain,' said the farrier, "'for it looked bad when Justice Malham hears as respectable men like us had an information laid afore him and took no steps.' The landlord agreed with this view, and after taking the sense of the company, and duly rehearsing a small ceremony known in high ecclesiastical life as the Nolo Episcopari, he consented to take on himself the chill dignity of going to Kench's. But to the farrier's strong disgust, Mr. Macy now started an objection to his proposing himself as a deputy constable, for that oracular old gentleman, claiming to know the law, stated as a fact delivered to him by his father that no doctor could be a constable. "'And you're a doctor, I reckon, though you're only a cow doctor, for a fly's a fly, though it may be a hoss-fly,'
concluded Mr. Macy, wondering a little at his own cuteness. There was a hot debate upon this, the farrier being of course indisposed to renounce the quality of a doctor, but contending that a doctor could be a constable if he liked. The law meant he needn't be one if he didn't like. Mr. Macy thought this was nonsense, since the law was not likely to be fonder of doctors than of other folks. Moreover, if it was in the nature of doctors more than of other men not to like being constables, how came Mr. Dowless to be so eager to act in that capacity? "'I don't want to act the constable,' said the farrier, driven into a corner by this merciless reasoning. "'And there's no man can say it of me if he tells the truth. But if there's to be any jealousy and envying about going to Kench's in the rain, let them go as like it. You won't get me to go, I can tell you.' By the landlord's intervention, however, the dispute was accommodated. Mr. Dowless consented to go as a second person disinclined to act officially. And so poor Silas, furnished with some old coverings, turned out with his two companions into the rain again. Thinking of the long night hours before him, not as those do who long to rest, but as those who expect to watch for the morning. Chapter 8 when Godfrey Cass returned from Mrs. Osgood's party at midnight, he was not much surprised to learn that Dunsey had not come home. Perhaps he had not sold Wildfire, and was waiting for another chance. Perhaps on that foggy afternoon he had preferred housing himself at the Red Line at Batherley for the night, if the run had kept him in that neighbourhood, for he was not likely to feel much concern about leaving his brother in suspense. Godfrey's mind was too full of Nancy Lammeter's looks and behaviour too full of the exasperation against himself and his lot, which the sight of her had always produced in him, for him to give much thought to wildfire or to the probabilities of Dunstan's conduct. The next morning the whole village was excited by the story of the robbery, and Godfrey, like every one else, was occupied in gathering and discussing news about it, and in visiting the stone pits. The rain had washed away all possibility of distinguishing footmarks but a close investigation of the spot had disclosed, in the direction opposite to the village, a tinder-box with a flint and steel half sunk in the mud. It was not Silas's tinder-box, for the only one he had ever had was still standing on its shelf, and the inference generally accepted was that the tinder-box in the ditch was somehow connected with the robbery. A small minority shook their heads and intimated their opinion that it was not a robbery to have much light thrown on it by tinder-boxes that Master Marner's tale had a queer look to it, and that such things had been known as a man's doing himself a mischief, and then setting the justice to look for the doer. But when questioned closely as to their grounds for this opinion, and what Master Marner had to gain by such false pretenses, they only shook their heads as before, and observed that there was no knowing what some folks counted gain. Moreover, that everybody had a right to their own opinions, grounds or no grounds and that the weaver, as everybody knew, was partly crazy. Mr. Macy, though he joined in the defence of Marner against all suspicions of deceit, also pooh-poohed the tinder-box, indeed repudiated it as a rather impious suggestion, tending to imply that everything must be done by human hands, and that there was no power which could make away with the guineas without moving the bricks. Nevertheless he turned round rather sharply on Mr. Tucky, when the zealous deputy, feeling that this was a view of the case particularly suited to a parish clerk, carried it still farther and doubted whether it was right to inquire into a robbery at all, when the circumstances were so mysterious. "'As if,' concluded Mr. Tucky, "'as if there was nothing but what could be made out by justices and constables.' "'Now, don't you be for overshooting the mark, Tucky,' said Mr. Macy, nodding his head aside admonishingly. "'That's what you're all is at.' If I throw a stone and hit, you think there's somewhat better than hitting, and you try to throw a stone beyond. What I said was against the tinder-box. I said nothing against justices and constables, for they're a King George's making, and it'd be ill becoming a man in a parish office to fly out again King George. While these discussions were going on amongst the group outside the rainbow, a higher consultation was being carried on within under the presidency of Mr. Crackenthorpe, the rector, assisted by Squire Cass and other substantial parishioners. 
It had just occurred to Mr. Snell, the landlord, he being, as he observed, a man accustomed to put two and two together, to connect with the tinder-box, which, as deputy constable, he himself had had the honourable distinction of finding, certain recollections of a peddler who had called to drink at the house about a month before, and had actually stated that he carried a tinder-box about with him to light his pipe. Here surely was a clue to be followed out. And as memory, when duly impregnated with ascertained facts, is sometimes surprisingly fertile, Mr. Snell gradually recovered a vivid impression of the effect produced on him by the peddler's countenance and conversation. He had a look with his eye which fell unpleasantly on Mr. Snell's sensitive organism. To be sure, he didn't say anything particular. No, except about the tinder-box. But it isn't what a man says, it's the way he says it. Moreover, he had a swarthy foreignness of complexion which boded little honesty. Did he wear earrings? Mr. Crackenthorpe wished to know, having some acquaintance with foreign customs. Well, stay, let me see, said Mr. Snell, like a docile clairvoyant, who would really not make a mistake if she could help it. After stretching the corners of his mouth and contracting his eyes, as if he were trying to see the earrings, he appeared to give up the effort and said, Well, he'd got earrings in his box to sell, so it's natural to suppose he might wear them. But he called at every house almost in the village. There's somebody else mayhap saw him in his ears, though I can't take upon myself rightly to say. Mr. Snell was correct in his surmise that somebody else would remember the peddler's earrings, for on the spread of inquiry among the villagers it was stated with gathering emphasis that the parson had wanted to know whether the peddler wore earrings in his ears, and an impression was created that a great deal depended on the eliciting of this fact. Of course, every one who heard the question, not having any distinct image of the peddler as without earrings, immediately had an image of him with earrings, larger or smaller as the case might be. And the image was presently taken for a vivid recollection, so that the glazier's wife, a well-intentioned woman not given to lying, and whose house was among the cleanest in the village, was ready to declare, as sure as ever she meant to take the sacrament the very next Christmas that was ever coming, that she had seen big earrings in the shape of the young moon in the peddler's two ears, while Ginny Oates, the cobbler's daughter, being a more imaginative person, stated not only that she had seen them too, but that they had made her blood creep as it did that very moment while there she stood. Also, by way of throwing further light on this clue of the tinder-box, a collection was made of all the articles purchased from the peddler at various houses, and carried to the rainbow to be exhibited there. In fact, there was a general feeling in the village that for the clearing up of this robbery there must be a great deal done at the rainbow, and that no man need offer his wife an excuse for going there, while it was the scene of severe public duties. Some disappointment was felt, and perhaps a little indignation also, when it became known that Silas Marner, on being questioned by the squire and the parson, had retained no other recollection of the peddler than that he had called at his door but had not entered his house, having turned away at once when Silas, holding the door ajar, had said that he wanted nothing. This had been Silas's testimony, though he clutched strongly at the idea of the peddler's being the culprit, if only because it gave him a definite image of a whereabout for his gold after it had been taken away from its hiding-place. He could see it now in the peddler's box. But it was observed with some irritation in the village that anybody but a blind creature like Marner would have seen a man prowling about, for how came he to leave his tinder-box in the ditch close by if he hadn't been lingering there? Doubtless he had made his observations when he saw Marner at the door. Anybody might know, and only look at him, that the weaver was a half-crazy miser. It was a wonder the peddler hadn't murdered him. Men of that sort, with rings in their ears, had been known for murderers often and often. There had been one tried at the Sizes not long ago, but what there were people living who remembered it. Godfrey Cass, indeed, entering the rainbow during one of Mr. Snell's frequently repeated recitals of his testimony, had treated it lightly, stating that he himself had bought a penknife of the peddler, and thought him a merry grinning fellow enough. It was all nonsense, he said, about the man's evil looks. But this was spoken of in the village as the random talk of youth as if it was only Mr. Snell who had seen something odd about the peddler. On the contrary, there were at least half a dozen who were ready to go before Justice Malham, 
and give in much more striking testimony than any the landlord could furnish. It was to be hoped Mr. Godfrey would not go to Tarley and throw cold water on what Mr. Snell said there, and so prevent the justice from drawing up a warrant. He was suspected of intending this when, after midday, he was seen setting off on horseback in the direction of Tarley. But by this time Godfrey's interest in the robbery had faded before his growing anxiety about Dunstan and Wildfire, and he was going not to Tarley but to Batherley, unable to rest in uncertainty about them any longer. The possibility that Dunstan had played him the ugly trick of riding away with Wildfire, to return at the end of a month when he had gambled away or otherwise squandered the price of the horse, was a fear that urged itself upon him more even than the thought of an accidental injury. And now that the dance at Mrs. Osgood's was past, he was irritated with himself that he had trusted his horse to Dunstan. Instead of trying to still his fears he encouraged them, with that superstitious impression which clings to us all, that if we expect evil very strongly it is the less likely to come. And when he heard a horse approaching at a trot, and saw a hat rising above a hedge beyond an angle of the lane, he felt as if his conjuration had succeeded. But no sooner did the horse come within sight than his heart sank again. It was not Wildfire, and in a few moments he discerned that the rider was not Dunstan, but Bryce, who pulled up to speak with a face that implied something disagreeable. "'Well, Mr. Godfrey, that's a lucky brother of yours, that Master Dunsey, isn't he?' "'What do you mean?' said Godfrey hastily. "'Why, hasn't he been home yet?' said Bryce. "'Home? No. What has happened? Be quick. What has he done with my horse?' "'Ah! I thought it was yours, though he pretended you had parted with it to him. Has he thrown him down and broken his knees?' said Godfrey, flushed with exasperation. "'Worse than that,' said Bryce. Oh, "'You see, I would made a bargain with him to buy the horse for a hundred and twenty a swinging price, but I always liked the horse. And what does he do but go and stake him? Fly at a hedge with stakes in it, atop of a bank with a ditch before it. The horse had been dead a pretty good while when he was found. So he hasn't been home since, has he?" "'Home? No,' said Godfrey. "'And he'd better keep away. Confound me for a fool! I might have known this would be the end of it.' "'Well, to tell you the truth,' said Bryce. After I'd bargained for the horse, it did come into my head that he might be riding and selling the horse without your knowledge, for I didn't believe it was his own. I knew Master Dunsey was up to his trick sometimes. But where can he be gone? He's never been seen at Batherley. He couldn't have been hurt, for he must have walked off. Hurt, said Godfrey bitterly. He'll never be hurt. He's made to hurt other people. And so you did give him leave to sell the horse, eh? said Bryce. "'Yes, I wanted to part with the horse. He was always a little too hard in the mouth for me,' said Godfrey, his pride making him wince under the idea that Bryce guessed the sale to be a matter of necessity. "'I was going to see after him. I thought some mischief had happened. I'll go back now,' he added, turning his horse's head, and wishing he could get rid of Bryce, for he felt that the long dreaded crisis in his life was close upon him. "'You're coming on to Raveloe, aren't you?' "'Well, no, not now,' said Bryce. "'I was coming round there, for I had to go to Flitton, and I thought I might as well take you in my way, and just let you know all I knew myself about the horse. I suppose Master Dunsey didn't like to show himself till the ill news had blown over a bit. He's perhaps gone to pay a visit at the Three Crowns by Whitbridge. I know he's fond of the house.' "'Perhaps he is,' said Godfrey, rather absently. Then, rousing himself, he said, with an effort at carelessness, well, we shall hear of him soon enough, I'll be bound. Well, here's my turning, said Bryce, not surprised to perceive that Godfrey was rather down. So I'll bid you good day, and wish I may bring you better news another time. Godfrey rode along slowly, representing to himself the scene of confession to his father, from which he felt that there was now no longer any escape. The revelation about the money must be made the very next morning and if he withheld the rest Dunstan would be sure to come back shortly, and finding that he must bear the brunt of his father's anger, would tell the whole story out of spite, even though he had nothing to gain by it. There was one step perhaps by which he might still win Dunstan's silence and put off the evil day. He might tell his father that he himself had spent the money paid to him by Fowler, and as he had never been guilty of such an offence before the affair would blow over after a little storming. 
but Godfrey could not bend himself to this. He felt that in letting Dunstan have the money he had already been guilty of a breach of trust hardly less culpable than that of spending the money directly for his own behoof. And yet there was a distinction between the two acts which made him feel that the one was so much more blackening than the other as to be intolerable to him. "'I don't pretend to be a good fellow,' he said to himself. "'But I'm not a scoundrel. At least I'll stop short somewhere. I'll bear the consequences of what I have done sooner than make believe I've done what I never would have done. I'd never have spent the money for my own pleasure. I was tortured into it. Through the remainder of this day Godfrey, with only occasional fluctuations, kept his will bent in the direction of a complete avowal to his father, and he withheld the story of Wildfire's loss till the next morning, that it might serve him as an introduction to heavier matters. The old squire was accustomed to his son's frequent absence from home, and thought neither Dunstan's nor Wildfire's non-appearance a matter calling for remark. Godfrey said to himself again and again that if he let slip this one opportunity of confession he might never have another. The revelation might be made even in a more odious way than by Dunstan's malignity. She might come as she had threatened to do. And then he tried to make the scene easier to himself by rehearsal. He made up his mind how he would pass from the admission of his weakness in letting Dunstan have the money to the fact that Dunstan had a hold on him which he had been unable to shake off, and how he would work up his father to expect something very bad before he told him the fact. The old squire was an implacable man. He made resolutions in violent anger, and he was not to be moved from them after his anger had subsided, as fiery volcanic matters cool and harden into rock. Like many violent and implacable men, he allowed evils to grow under favour of his own heedlessness, till they pressed on him with exasperating force. And then he turned round with fierce severity and became unrelentingly hard. This was a system with his tenants. He allowed them to get into arrears, neglect their fences, reduce their stock, sell their straw, and otherwise go the wrong way. And then, when he became short of money in consequence of this indulgence, he took the hardest measures and would listen to no appeal. Godfrey knew all this, and felt it with a greater force because he had constantly suffered annoyance from witnessing his father's sudden fits of unrelentingness, for which his own habitual irresolution deprived him of all sympathy. He was not critical of the faulty indulgence which preceded these fits. That seemed to him natural enough. Still there was just the chance, Godfrey thought, that his father's pride might see this marriage in a light that would induce him to hush it up, rather than turn his son out and make the family the talk of the country for ten miles round. This was the view of the case that Godfrey managed to keep before him pretty closely till midnight, and he went to sleep thinking that he had done with inward debating. But when he awoke in the still morning darkness he found it impossible to reawaken his evening thoughts. It was as if they had been tired out and were not to be roused to further work. Instead of arguments for confession, he could now feel the presence of nothing but its evil consequences. The old dread of disgrace came back, the old shrinking from the thought of raising a hopeless barrier between himself and Nancy, the old disposition to rely on chances which might be favourable to him, and save him from betrayal. Why, after all, should he cut off the hope of them by his own act? He had seen the matter in a wrong light yesterday. He had been in a rage with Dunstan and had thought of nothing but a thorough break-up of their mutual understanding. But what it would really be wisest for him to do was to try and soften his father's anger against Dunsey, and keep things as nearly as possible in their old condition. If Dunsey did not come back for a few days, and Godfrey did not know but that the rascal had enough money in his pocket to enable him to keep away still longer, everything might blow over. <laughs> 